Hello and welcome back to another video. In this one, we will discuss if Prigozhin was right after all. And by that, I mean, will Russia capture the Donbass region by February 2025? This thought first came out at the start of the war, where American generals were saying that Russia would win the war in three days. Everyone really was expecting the quite the vast majority were suspecting Russia to have a quick victory in Ukraine. Instead, we saw Ukraine hold out for what is now almost two years. Yet we see no sign of collapse at the front line to a point where Ukraine would lose the war. But at the same time, we do see that the Russians now have a significant advantage on the front line. This advantage is shown by the fact that the Russians now have, according to Putin, 617,000 soldiers at the front line, active in combat operations. This means that the Russian army has tripled since the start of the invasion. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians have also built up and increased the amount of soldiers they have available. However, in comparison, the Russians' growth is much higher. We also see that the Western aid has significantly slowed down to a point that even if both packages go through here in January, it will take months before anything realistically comes to Ukraine. And with that, we can see that Ukrainians' offensive capabilities through this year is very limited. It is very unlikely that they'll be able to muster up an offensive force by the summer. This means something very significant. That is that the front line will only go one way through the next coming six to nine months. And that is in Ukraine's direction. The Russians will capture territory. The question is how much and if these eight packages get and go through Congress and the European Parliament, how long will it take for them to actually reach the front line in Ukraine? Historically speaking, based on the past months, it'll take quite a while. Therefore, it is unrealistic for them to build up an army that is offensively capable by the summer. And therefore, the Russians will have the momentum from this January and until summer, likely until next winter. And this all shows a year in which Russia has the offensive capability and advantage to actually launch offensive operations. In relation to that, we have this article here by the Sunday Guardian, which is an editor's choice. Will 2024 be the year Russia wins? I don't believe that it will be a complete victory. I do, however, believe that Russia will be the winner of 2024. And then brings us back to a statement made by Prigozhin over a year ago, or almost a year ago, on the 11th of February, Reuters wrote this article, Russia could take two years to capture Ukrainian regions. These Ukrainian regions are the Donbass region. Two years from February 2023, isn't that February 2025? And that is exactly when I expect the Russians to have full control over the Donbass region. So let's dive further into that. Why do I believe that? Beyond the fact that the Russians now have offensive capabilities that are vast and able to continue for, for example, a year, and the Ukrainians not having offensive capabilities for the next year, it is clear that the Russians will switch to offensive operations and stay like that until that their own offensive capabilities are dried up or that the Ukrainians have built up their own army. And this, as I said earlier, would take longer than this summer season. It will take until next winter before a Ukrainian army is ready to launch offensive operations at a large scale, similar to that of this summer that just passed. So what we're currently seeing is that the Russians are attacking in several key points. There's the Battle of Avdivka, Battle of Novomikhailivka, the Battle of Uledar, and in the direction of the Krivina Liman area and in the direction of Kobyansk. We are seeing fighting west of Bakhmut and in the direction of Siversk. Taking a look at these areas compared to months ago, 
we see that the Russians ended the Ukrainian offensive and is now pushing beyond what the Ukrainians captured on the northern flank and are trying to push them back in the southern flank. If this trend continues for just a couple of months longer, the Russians will likely reach the canal line and have the whole front by it here to the west of Bakhmut. This would free up a lot of soldiers to move in the northern directions along the canal line and go around Siversk, pushing and launching an operation in this direction. We are already seeing operations to the northwest of Solidar and northeast of Solidar in the direction of Vesele, in the direction of Liemka and in the direction of Spirne. All of these operations point towards the Russians looking to attack Siversk from a southern direction and likely those keep pushing westwards until they capture Bohdanivka, Kalinia, Hurovodivka and so on until they have a front by the canal freeing up their forces allowing them to capture Ivanivska cutting off the southern flank and then launching attacks towards Siversk. A half a year, three months, nine months, whichever how long it will be the Russians will have a higher chance of capturing Siversk. That is only for the Bakhmut front. Capturing the canal line west of Bakhmut and the Siversk front here in the next couple, three to six months, that will likely leave the Ukrainian front to the slovyansk konstantinivka line. The slovyansk konstantinivka line is what is called the final line of defense of the Donbass region. As beyond the slovensk Konstantinivka line, there really isn't that much that the Ukrainians can defend. It is the end of the industrial zone of the Donbass region. It has lower dens population density. All of the things that makes the Donbass a very difficult place to fight in ends beyond the slovensk Konstantinivka line. The fortifications the Ukrainians have built ends beyond the slovensk Konstantinivka line. Everything beyond that will become much easier for the Russians to go through than the Donbass region itself. That is why we're seeing that this will be the last line of defense of the Ukrainians, and it will likely be reached by the summer if the trend continues as is, which is evident by the fact that the Russians have built up their forces and the Ukrainians are not receiving the aid they need to counteract that. As for the northern direction and the Luhansk Kharkiv border, we will likely see continuous at attempts by the Russians to advance in the direction of Kobiansk, west of Svatove, and in the direction of the Serbets River here west of Kremenna. What we are seeing in this direction is very interesting because what we have seen based on video evidence is that the Russians launch some offensive operations but they never really commit. This raises the question, what is the purpose of these operations? I had this discussion with someone and we ended up concluding that the Russians are here looking to grind down and weaken the Ukrainian army, but the Ukrainians are not on the offensive here. So the Ukrainians defending have their hideouts, they have their dugouts and all of these areas, which makes it very difficult for the Russians to actually fight them unless they themselves go on offensive operations. So this raises the question, is the offensive operations that the Russians are doing that they're not committing to, is it to draw out the Ukrainian defenders in these areas to hit them when they expose themselves. That is the conclusion I ended up with. So the Russians here are not committing to launch offensive operations to capture territory, but they're instead trying to reveal the Ukrainian positions at the cost of their own to grind down the Ukrainian forces before launching their offensive. So you're likely seeing that the Russians here are clearing mines, hitting the Ukrainian fortifications, and all of this in an attempt to draw down and draw out and grind down the Ukrainian forces prior to their offensive. Although I say at the cost of their own, we've seen that they launch an attack with 10 armored vehicles, all 10 retrieve after mounting of about 10 soldiers, all 10 armored vehicles survive this attempt. The 10 soldiers likely do not. But the question is, how many soldiers do the Ukrainians lose to get rid of these 10 Russian soldiers? If they lose a couple of BMPs, an artillery position and a couple of soldiers, then that assault would be worth it for the Russian perspective. And that is likely the case if the Russians have this significant artillery advantage that they do. So we'll likely see these sort of operations continue and we'll likely see that the Russians will try to push westwards of Kremenda, continuing these positional fighting positions until they get a, I don't know what their conditions are, but as soon as they are hit, we will likely see Russian advances that are committed 
by their forces where they do not run away after dismounting a couple of infantry and actually launch assaults. This is something evident by the losses reported by Media Zona. If we take a look at all troops, we see that since the winter months where the PMC Wagner and the inmates were taking a lot of losses, also the mobilized forces who were just sent to the front, newly acquired, were taking a lot of casualties. We see that where we can choose different parts. We have PMC from December to May. We have inmates from November to March. And then we have the mobilized here in December through the winter months. A lot of casualties compared to any other time. But something very interesting is if we look at tankers, there's hardly been any Russian tankers casualties since November of last year, of two years ago now. That is many, many months. All of 2023 hardly had any Russian tankers casualties. This is likely because most of the tanks that the Ukrainians managed to destroy throughout 2023 were abandoned tanks. We see that the Russians do not commit in these offensives, which saves the lives of the soldiers. There's also the possibility that the improvements that the Russian tanks have gone through throughout the conflict has uh, increased the survivability of the infantry in these tanks. But all in all, this means that the Russian tankers have hardly suffered any losses through 2023. And as a result of that, we see that the Russian army has tripled in size since and throughout 2023. This means that the Russians could have three times as many tankers. If they have three times as many tankers and possibly also three times as many tanks, then their offensive capabilities when it comes to armored assaults have tripled. That is much higher than the first months of this war where we saw that the Russians took huge swaths of territory. However, of course, it cannot be put together. It cannot be compared to the start of the war because so many things were different back then compared to now. But it also shows that if the Russians actually launch armored assaults where they are committed, then we will likely see a collapse of the Ukrainian front due to the sheer amount of armored vehicles, tankers, and equipment the Russians have available, especially if they continue grinding down the Ukrainian defenses in the front line. We then move on to the southern parts of the front line where we see in the direction of Marinka, the Russians mission to capture Marinka, the next defensive city in the area is Krasnovarivka, heavily fortified trenches everywhere. If you zoom in, you can see trenches here to the south, to the east. This whole first line and areas beyond are completely heavily fortified with trenches, dug-ins, concrete fortifications, bunkers, everything you need for fortifications. It is beyond Marinka. And Marinka took the Russians two years to capture. How long would Krasnodivka take? But at the same time, we see that the Battle of Avdivka is nearing its end. Although it has continued for a long time, it will likely end within the two to three next months, as Selushny himself said, the commander in chief of the Ukrainian army. That is due to the heavy pressure of the Russians in the area. Even if the Ukrainians drag it out at the very most six months, but after that, there's no heavily fortified area all the way to Pokrovsk. It will be like the area east of Bakhmut, where the Russians manage to capture Popasna, after which a couple of weeks go past by, and the Russians have captured Lysyshansk, they have gone to Bakhmut, and they are fighting in Solodar. The point being that the Russians are at a point where the heavy fortifications, the advantages the Ukrainians have in the defense in the Donbass region, is decreasing rapidly. The longer time goes by where they are in an uninterrupted offensive operations, the worse it becomes for the Ukrainians defending as they become weaker and weaker in their defense. The Russians are also becoming weaker in their offense as longer time goes by due to the attrition that they're suffering from these offensive operations. The difference is that the Russians are not reliant on the West's whims of whether or not to give support how long it takes for this support to arrive when the Russians have had a constant influx of about 30 to 50,000 soldiers every month through 2023. And they have, a, according to official information from the Russian Federation, received over 20,000 UAVs. They have received over 2,000 tanks and other armored vehicles throughout 2023. That is at a completely different scale to what the West is giving to Ukraine. 
and as such, the Russians can suffer more attrition than the Ukrainians and still have the advantage continuously over a long period of time. And that is if the Ukrainians actually receive help from the West. So overall, it looks very grim for the Ukrainians. It's just like prior to the Ukrainian offensive. My main critic points of the Ukrainians was that they didn't have nearly enough of what they needed to launch a successful offensive. And again, this was also stated by Seloshny, the Ukrainian commander in chief. So if you have any respect for him, if you have any recognition of his abilities, because I do, I have respect for his abilities and I recognize his capability. However, as he said, he needed hundreds and thousands of tanks and armored vehicles, yet he only received hundreds. He needed so much more artillery, MLRS, he even called for about 200 HIMARS systems yet he has received about 50 at most. I have no idea how much he actually received. The point is, he didn't receive nearly enough of what was needed for the Saporizhia offensive, yet he had to go through with it anyways because he was commanded to. The point being, even Solution knew it was a failure before it even started. I knew it was a failure before it even started. And now I can see that the necessary requirements Solution asked for for his offensive, the Russians do have prior to their own. If you call FDFK a big offensive with thousands of Russian losses every day since it began, then you are delusional. The Russians have hardly lost anything since the start of the battle. The casualties increased by about 50 to 100 percent. Then it has gone back down in November, late October, and now it has returned to this general state here between July and October, where the Russians hardly took any casualties. At the start of the Ukrainian offensive, it was much more intense and they took more casualties. Prior to that, when the Russian forces were storming Bakhmut, they took more casualties. But there is this a general level here in the summer periods where the Russians were majorly inactive compared to the winter periods. This is why we are likely going to see more activity by the Russians in these coming months, in this winter period to early spring period. And we'll likely see this trend continue till the end of the year. So the question, will 2024 be the year Russia wins? No, but Russia will win 2024. And that is going to be all for this update. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.